Yeah. So it's time. And the first of all, uh, I would like to say Happy New Year uh, 2024 and with all of our participants of the ICC have a prosperous, fruitful uh, New Year uh, in 2024. Thank you for coming. Uh, good morning and good evening. I am Dr. P.Y. Cho and my colleague, Dr. Junior Tu. Uh, we both will moderate this uh, webinar. Professor Fayez is uh, always uh, like our family and uh, of the Chang'an uh, Memorial Hospital. And he is the, one of the most uh, supportive the colleagues and uh, to uh, the Chang'an Craniofacial Team at ICC. In the past, Professor Fayez already gave us a three times of uh, educational lecture, especially focused on uh, her majority and her specialist uh, of the CLEP area and the focusing on the CLEP pallet repair. Professor Faya's team has performed more than 26,000 free CLEP lip and uh, pallet surgery all over the world, including Rwanda, Mexico, Philippines, Morocco, and he is going to establish a new hospital at Lahore, Pakistan, and where free surgery will be provided to those who in need, such as the clavid lip and palate, craniofacial deformities, and so on. Currently, Professor Fayez is the president to lead Pakistan associations of the plastic surgeons. Today, professors will present the topic of the algorithm for management of the submucous clip palate. And today we have a two uh, very good friends uh, as our panelists. The first one is Professor Takayuki Honda from the Iwade Medical University, Japan. And the other one uh, is our old friend, Professor Bernard from Philippine NCF2. So can wait to learn from Professor Fayas. So please, Professor. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Yes, please. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, with the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. And thank you very much for asking me to give this talk at the first webinar of the 2024. So we are going to discuss something for some mucus cleft palate today. So the incidence is one in 1200 childbirth. And from the general population, maybe 0 0.02 to 0 0.8 among the general population. Majority, they are isolated submucous cleft palate, but sometimes there may be associated incomplete cleft lip. Rarely, we can see a congenital fistula in the submucous area as well. So, probably there are insult from the environmental factor that there may be genetic mutations which are responsible for the submucous cleft palate. And there is lack of midline fusion of the muscle within the soft palate area. Whenever there is interference or the insult during the 8th to 12th week, the palate is already in the stage of normal development and the palatal shelf have fused. But then the insult comes and leads to weakening of the fusion and it can lead to anomalous shelf fusion or failure of mesodermal proliferation resulting in some mucus cleft palate and bifid fistula, by bifid uvula. And sometimes when there's extreme degree of insult, there may be congenital palatal fistula in the some mucus area. So what are the problems when we have a patient with some mucus cleft palate? There will be nasal regurgitation. The feeding time would be prolonged. Patient may get ear infection. The speech is not understandable. Patient has nasal air emission. Some mucus cleft palate was first described in 1825 by Rokes, JP. 
and Kelly was the first person who used the term sub mucus cleft palate in 1910. And Kellner described the clinical triad. And this is the clinical triad, the bifid uvula, and bluish translucent tint in the soft palate tissue called zona pellucida. And there is a notch in the hard palate. Yoshiki Mori from Japan described different types of bony disparity in submucous cleft palate, and that may be absence of posterior nasal spine, there may be V shaped bony notch, and the bony defect can extend up to the incisive foramen. So, how we should diagnose the submucous cleft palate? Occult submucous cleft palate is very difficult to be diagnosed, and usually it can be missed. We should always diagnose submucous cleft palate by a plastic surgeon as well as a speech pathologist. And we should do thorough oral examination and we should listen to the speech of the patient. Nasopharyngoscopic examination can be quite helpful to see the palatal movements and video flooring examination it can also show the palate movement from the side view. So what are the plans of management? If the patient voice is good, then we do not need to intervene, no surgery is needed. If the patient's speech is not good, then there can be four options. Speech therapy alone can improve the voice, so no surgery will be needed. Or we need to do the palate repair and the patient's speech improve dramatically. Or we do the palate repair and we ask the speech pathologist to help in this patient. And sometimes we do the palate repair, we add the pharyngeal flap, and then speech therapy is also needed to make the patient's speech legible. So <clears throat> many of the friends would think that some mucous cleft palate is quite easy as compared to cleft of the soft palate or incomplete palate. If we compare both conditions, the diagnosis is straightforward in the cleft palate, whether it's soft palate, incomplete, or complete, unilateral, or bilateral. But some mucus, it is usually missed. I have missed many of my patients during the, during the first examination. Surgery is indicated always in cleft palate, usually needed in soft some mucus, but rarely not if the speech is good. We do not need any surgery. Muscle status. Muscles are well developed in complete cleft palate or incomplete cleft palate. But in some mucus, because of the insult, they may be thin or weak as they may have been, have been damaged by the insult process. Ease of surgery. There are clear cut guidelines. But in some mucus cleft palate, the tissues are quite delicate and very thin. So we have to do the surgery very carefully. So, what are the different techniques we can use? We can use the midline incision only, and we do all the dissection from the medial incisions, and we do not make any lateral incision. We can do lung and back. We usually do incision on the right side, and on the left side, we all do the dissection from the medial incision. And body to flap, to flap palatoplast, we have never used in we have a series of probably more than 125 patients. We have never used the Bardak. But some people have used furlopalatoplasty. And one of our colleagues, we wrote a paper in PRS, in another uh, plastic surgery. So if the patient age is more, we can do the lung and back and pharyngeal flap in the same stage. So there have been different classification and grading systems for some mucus cleft palate. Susan grading, they, she has described the rugae pattern in the cleft palate, which may be an additional diagnostic feature of the mucus cleft palate. Professor Brian Somerle described the grading from 0, 1, 2, and 3, depending upon the, the uh, bifid uvula, notch in the hard palate, and the muscle uh, separation, depending upon the extent of it. But there is no description of different techniques used 
if there are different grades of some mucus cleft palate. So why we developed a new classification for some mucus cleft palate? The classification should describe various types of some mucus cleft palate based on the area involved, length of the palate, normal or short, and then it should be able to devise an algorithm according to each situation. So we describe some mucus cleft palate one, A, when the area is involved with uvula and the soft palate and the palate length is normal and we do not make any lateral incision, we no lateral incision made and then we do levator dissection and retrofixation. We will call it 1B if the palate is short. If the palate is short and the we do not make any lateral incision. We do levator dissection and retrofixation. If the patient is before less than four years of age, we will do palatal lengthening. If the patient age is more than four years, we will do pharyngeal flap at the same stage. If the area involved is uvula, soft palate, and posterior half of the hard palate, palate length is normal, we will do lung and back, but we will make incision only on the right side. The left-handed surgeon can make incision on the left side only. And we do the radical dissection of the greater palatine vessel on one side. We do the better dissection and retrofixation. If the palate length is short, we will call it submucous cleft palate 2B. And we will do a lung and back only right incision, liberated dissection, retrofixation. If the patient age is less than four years, we will do palatal lengthening. If the patient age is more than four years, we will do pharyngeal flap at the same stage. If the area involved with uvula, soft palate, posterior half of the hard palate, and it is extending up to the anterior half of the hard palate, and palate length is normal, we do lung and back, and we do the levator dissection and retro fixation. However, if the palate length is short, we will add the, we will do the palatal lengthening or we will add pharyngeal flap, depending upon the age of the patient. But that's our algorithm. Midline incision only in some mucus cleft palate one. We make right lateral incision in some mucus cleft palate two. And we make releasing incision on both sides in some mucus cleft palate 3. So, in some mucus cleft palate 1, as we discuss again, we only make midline incision to do all the dissection of the nasal, oral layer, and levator dissection. In some mucus cleft palate 2, we make midline incision as well as lateral incision on one side, right side, or maybe on left side. And we make incision to do the dissection of nasal layer, oral layer, and levator dissection. In some mucus cleft palate 3, we make midline incision and incision on both sides to do the dissection of the nasal, oral layer, and levator dissection. And also, if we need the pharyngeal flap. So, how do we proceed in some mucus cleft palate? In the midline area, we make midline incision and we cut only the oral layer. And we try to maintain the nasal layer intact. Then we undermine the oral layer laterally on both sides. Then we close the nasal layer first in the region of bifid uvula and posterior soft palate and extending anteriorly if needed. Then we do the levator dissection on both sides and we do the posterior fixation together and with the nasal mucosa very near to the uvula. We take always, we always take the bite of nasal mucosa very near to the uvula so that the muscles remain fixed posteriorly. If we just suture the muscles together, muscles will shift anteriorly. If the patient is less than four years of age, palate repair would be done. If palate looks short, we will do posterior lengthening just anterior to the uvula so that the uh, uh, length of the palate is increased and we will fix the levator to the most posterior midline position 
very near to the new uvula. If the patient has the less than four years and we have already operated the patient, so we will wait for three to three to point five years of age of the patient to do the final speech evaluation. Then we can decide whether we need to intervene or only the speech therapy can improve the patient's speech. If the palate looks short in length and the patient is already four years old, so we would add pharyngeal flap during the primary repair of some mucus cleft palate. When we do the local infiltration, especially in the some mucus cleft palate area, if we use the needle like this, this will either puncture both the layers and the fluid will go into the nasal cavity. So we usually bend the needle up to 45 degree so we can make a comfortable plane between the oral and the nasal layer even in the midline areas. So for a new surgeon with little experience in some mucus clapilate surgeon surgery, it is quite difficult to separate the oral layer of the mucosa from the nasal mucosa in the sub mucus area of the cleft palate. So what we propose is they can make a small lateral incision 5 millimeter on the right side or on the left side in the mid lateral portion, premolar teeth area at the junction of the hard palate mucosa and gingiva in the hard palate area. Then using the periaphyl elevator, a plane is developed between the hard palate bone and the nasal lining in the soft palate area on right side. And then nasal lining of the soft palate on the left side through the same incision on the right side. In difficult cases, the incision may be made on both sides. Beginner surgeon should use lateral incision on both sides to develop a good plane. Then we separate the nasal and oral layer of the midline some mucus mucosa. Oral layer, the soft palatal mucosa is separated from the muscular part of the soft palate. And this is achieved by long tenotomy scissors as well as by blunt dissection using periaphyl elevator on both sides. I will show you in the videos. As the nasal layer is completely mobilized in the region of soft palate and anteriorly, a tension free closure can be achieved in the soft palate area. We usually use 5-0 polyglactin to close the nasal layer and we use continuous switches. Then we dissect the muscle from the nasal mucosa on both sides. Muscle dissection is relatively tedious as compared to that in a cleft of soft palate or complete cleft palate. We fix the muscle posteriorly using 3-0 or 4-0 polyglactin switches. We always use running continuous suture in the oral layer and we use 3-0 or 4-0 polyglactin suture for the oral layer pair. So uh, I'm showing you a submucous clap alert 3A. That means that is a extend the submucous portion is extending up to the anterior half of the hard palate. So we make incision in this area and the, we, we divide the bifid uvula into the nasal and the oral layer and we may lake, make lateral incision on both sides. So we have dissected, we have used the lung and back, we have dissected, separated the oral and the nasal layer on both sides and then we suture, we will suture both the nasal mucosa together. We always excise the thin mucosa on the medial side because this thin mucosa will not hold sutures and the blood supply is already poor in the thin portion. So we excise the nasal mucosa, thin nasal mucosa on the right side, then we excise thin nasal mucosa on the left side. So up to thick tissues. So now we start closing the nasal layer as a continuous and it has been completed. Then we dissect both levator on both sides. We suture the levator, we usually put three sutures 
to the levator and to the nasal mucosa anterior to the uvula <clears throat> so these are this is the excess the thin mucosa axi from both sides now you can uh, appreciate the, the mucosa is quite thick now to be sutured so we go continuous you can see after we so sub mucus clap palate one a midline incision only post up only midline incision midline incision only only midline incision only midline incision 1b that mean the uvula is by fit the soft palate is some mucus and the palate length is short so we have added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage again palate length is short we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage again palate length is short we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage again pharyngeal flap has been added at the same stage pharyngeal flap added at the same stage same pharyngeal flap added during the primary repair of the sub mucus cleft palate again some mucus cleft palate 1b palate length is short so we added the pharyngeal flap because the patient age is more than 4 years the young girl we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage some mucus cleft palate 2a so we made incision on the right side we dissected the uh, pedicle on the right side so that the flap can move comfortably to the left side Palate length has been increased. Congenital fistula, because this is two A, so we added, we made incision on the right side. So mucus cleft palate two A, long and back incision only on the right side. Incision made only on the right side. Some mucus cleft palate two B, that the palate length is short, so we added a pharyngeal flap at the same stage. Pharyngeal flap added at the same stage. Some mucus cleft palate three A, the some mucus cleft portion is extending up to the anterior half of the hard palate. so we made incision on only on both side to do all the dissection another patient we did the same some mucus cleft palate 3 b the palate length is short so we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage sometime we can get congenital fistula in doing the sub mucus portion in different locations so sub mucus cleft palate 1a fistula in the midline so because the palate length was short no so no the, we did not do the pharyngeal flap this is written wrong we did only the palate lengthening because the palate length was good sub mucus cleft palate 1b so we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage some mucus cleft palate 2a so we did the left alveolar so different fistula in different locations these are two fistula very thin mucosa in between again a congenital fistula we did incision only on the right side a larger fistula it's lb so we did the levator dissection on both side we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage 
some mucus clef pilot 3b so we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage the larger fistula we did all the dissection through both incision and we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage very large fistula we made lung and back incision on both side did the levator dissection we added the pharyngeal flap at the same stage again the mucus clef pilot 3b so we did the levator dissection on both sides did the levator dissection and also added a pharyngeal flap with more and more experience sometime uh, we may avoid lateral incision so some mucus clef pilot 2a we did all the dissection through mid midline incision only rather young kid we did all the dissection through the midline incision only only midline incision we added a pharyngeal flap as well same we also get fistula after surgery so there is the fistula developing in this area midline fistula in 125 patient we have eight fistula mostly in the midline but there is one large fistula on the left side whenever we get a fistula we always wait for 6 to 9 months after the last surgery to close the fistula so now i am going to share some videos so we are going to suture the bifid uvula suturing the uvula to both side together you are separating the oral layer of the soft palate from the muscular layer now we are going to dissect the levator on the left side from the nasal layer we use long anatomy scissor now dissection on the right side So we are suturing the levator, and you see, we are taking the bite of the nasal mucosa very near to the uvula, so that the muscle remain fixed posteriorly. now we are going to start the oral layer closure we go continuous switch using continuous suture on the oral and the nasal layer it will save time and suture so this is the priya picture this is the picture after 24 hour and this is the late picture of the patient for the video i just showed you
this is patient to some mucus clap pilot two way. The pilot length looks good. However, it extends up to the posterior half of the hard pilot. So we are separating the oral layer from the nasal layer. And now we are also separating the oral layer in the soft pellet. So now we are suturing the bifid uvula and the split nether layer in the soft pellet area. We usually put two or three suture to the uvula because uh, it's much better to shape the uvula by putting suture before the muscle dissection. One suture to the nasal side of the uvula. Dissection of the levator on left side. So suturing the levator together. Now we are going to close the oral layer as a continuous running suture. Gelatin foam on the Lateral defect, we always put sutures, loose sutures, so that the gelatin foam does not drop into the oral cavity or the pharynx. So, the, the, this is the, the same patient I showed you the video pre op after 24 hours and late post op picture. This is the last video and we are going to add a pharyngeal flap in this patient because the pilot length was short. Patient age is more than four years. This is an, probably this is an adult patient. We are trying to retract the oral side laterally so that we can have a good exposure. Now we are going to raise the pharyngeal flap. We always take triangular flap and the base of the pharyngeal flap is never more than 60% of the width of the posterior pharyngeal wall. So that we leave 20% area on both sides for breathing. And, and my team have done more than 1000 pharyngeal flap and only in two patients, we had to go back to uh, widen the area. Otherwise, we do not have any problem with the obstructive sleep apnea in our series. Even we do pharyngeal flap during the missions, whenever we go in, in the remote areas in Pakistan or Afghanistan. So the donor site has been closed by running switcher in the posterior pharyngeal wall. So now we are going to suture the right nether layer with the right side of the pharyngeal flap. We usually put three sutures on each side to close the nether layer with the pharyngeal flap on right side as well as on the left side. Now on the left side. Second suture, 
nasal layer of the soft palate on left side with the left side of the pharyngeal flap and the third suture now and now we do the dissection of the levator on both sides A section of elevator on the right side. We always take bite of, of the base of the pharyngeal flap with the elevator so that the muscles remain fixed as far posteriorly as possible. Now start up the oral air closure. We go continuous. Anteriorly, One more suture to the posterior part so that the every bit of the sides are sutured together comfortably. So this is the picture of the patient before, after 24 hours and at 6 months. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Professor Fayats, for the very thorough and complete um, explanation and um, of your treatment of how to treat the sub uh, some mucus uh, cleft palate condition. So um, because we have very enthusiastic audience today, so we have a lot of questions. So um, let's go to uh, the panel discussion first and invite yeah. our um, friends. So first, I'd like to invite Professor Honda, Professor Honda, please. Ah, okay. Um, thank you, Professor Farias. Nice to see you in uh, Happy New Year. And you are talking about the uh, primary uh, uh, pharyngeal flap surgery for the uh, submucous cleft palate uh, patients. But the uh, my question is: uh, How do you make decision of the uh, width of the pharyngeal flap? Uh, do you uh, every time make a, a fixed uh, width for the pharyngeal flap, or you may do use uh, uh, um, uh, another pharyngoscope examination before the surgery or not? Yeah, thank you. Actually, we usually use fixed width that is 60% of the width of the posterior pharyngeal wall. We do not go beyond that because uh, if we discuss uh, Patient, let's say a patient who has a complete cleft palate and he was operated for the palate repair and then he develops VPI and we, the speech pathologist said that the hypernasality is too much and there's the increased nasal air emission. And even if we recommend that we should use a wide pharyngeal flap, we do not go beyond 60% because if we go beyond 60%, patient will get obstructive sleep apnea, which will be more uh, problematic than if the patient's speech has improved, but it's not 100% improved, but there is no obstructive sleep apnea. So we usually remain at the most, uh, uh, most width is 60%, not more than that. Mm -hmm. So you are always fixed about the 60%, 
or yes. you may you may change even the no, other, other you patient. usually we usually say sometimes sometimes it may be 50 percent but generally as a rule we go up to 60 percent okay so even the adult patient you do you not do the nasopharyngeal uh, scope before the surgery we, 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 we do nasopharyngeal scope uh, mm -hmm. before surgery but mm -hmm. when our speech pathologist recommends the VPI surgery, we always do pharyngeal flap. I have never done a single sphincter pharyngoplasty so far, and we have never regretted. And uh, with 60% of the width of posterior pharyngeal wall, we do not have any problem with effective sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. I went only twice back to the patient. In one, there was false passages, which I have to open. In another patient, I the patient came back from the recovery because the anesthesiologist in the recovery will always make sure when I do the pharyngeal flap, he will close both the nostrils and he will make sure that the patient can breathe through the oral through the mouth without any problem. If the patient cannot breathe through the mouth after the pharyngeal surgery, pharyngeal flap surgery, we bring the patient. To, to the OR bed. And I have mm -hmm. and this happened only once. Because when we take 60% of the weight, there is no problem of this sleep apnea in our series. I have okay, seen many a uh, friend who will take almost 80% or 90% of the width of posterior pharyngeal wall. Those patients are bound to get sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And that is very miserable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And the second question is uh, about the uh, age for the primary pharyngeal flap surgery. You mentioned about the you uh, uh, the four years old, or it, the patient more than four years old, you you do a primary pharyngeal uh, flap surgery. Is there any reason for the the uh, four years old? Actually, uh, because I was trained at Shangren, I worked with Professor Lowe and Professor Philip Chen. Initially, they were doing at six years of age, and we were following their protocol. Mm -hmm. And then Professor Philip Chen told me that now I have shifted to four years of age, so now we our minimum limit is four years of age, and we do not have any problem uh, doing at four years or five years or six years. We don't have any problem. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Professor Honda. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Professor Tensipak. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Hey, um, ah. hi. Hi, uh, Bernie. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Thank you very much oh, thank for you. your thank you. Uh, very uh, good uh, presentation and a very good video. Um, I'd like to commend you on the uh, anatomic description of the Ruge. It added um, knowledge to me that I did not know. <laughs> that, so now it uh, helps me diagnose submucous cleft. Um, I also want to point out that the excision of the thinned out mucosa when you do your palate repair is, I think, very important, especially for the uh, younger surgeons who just think, oh, the mucosa is okay, I'll just suture it. But the thinned out mucosa definitely will dehease. No? Yeah, that's very um, important to know. Um, my, I have about three questions. So my first question is, you in your initial slide, you said, um, if the speech of the patient of, with the submucous cleft is normal, you don't need to do palate surgery. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, yes. Okay. But, so, this, but this happens very rarely. Okay. This because very uh, rarely. if you see a child, for example, at around one year old, referred to you with a submucous cleft, how long do you wait to, de to determine, say, oh, the speech is not going to be okay? I think surgery is required. We usually uh, keep in touch with the family. If the child development goes normally and this patient can speak ba, ka, da words as a normal kids, then we will keep waiting. But if the quality of these words like B, D, P are not good, we will pr proceed for surgery. Mm -hmm. So no specific time uh, of the, waiting. The maximum time to wait is three years. Okay. Or three and a half when the when the child can repeat the command if we want to say ah he can say ah so that he understand what we want from him or her to speak 
Uh, my second question is, in your protocol, you said uh, you determined part of your um, surgical plan based on the length of the palate, if it's normal or short. So what um, amount or how do you measure this palate length? What's your landmark or um, criteria? But basically, it, it's mostly visual. Mostly visually, if we can, uh, if we can touch the, if we can hold the uvula and it can touch the posterior pharyngeal wall comfortably, we, we would be happy. If it does not touch, maybe we can make a small cut just anterior to the uvula in the nasal mucosa as well as the oral mucosa. If it if it, if it can lengthen and it can reach the posterior pharyngeal wall, and if if it is not reaching even then, then we add a pharyngeal flap if the patient is more than. Four years old. So, um, uh, if, so correct me if I'm wrong. From what I understand, from what your uh, explanation is, is that the surgeon uh, will determine uh, intraoperatively. So yes, there's yes. no preoperative uh, or pre-surgery no, no. measurement. No, no, no. All right. No, no. All right. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question is: uh, So far, what are the speech results from the protocol that you have used? Um, it, because we have a very dedicated speech pathologist in our team. All our patients after surgery, they they go back to speech pathologist. Even any secondary patient coming who have been operated by our team or by other team, they always go to speech pathologist first and then patient come to the plastic surgeon. So our speech results have been encouraging. Though we do not have follow up of each and every patient because the patient we operate during the mission they have the poor follow up but the patient we operate at our center in Lahore we have very good follow up thank you very much oh, welcome please give my regards to Gilinda oh thank you all right I'll tell her all right thank you Dr. Tensipak so um we'll now go on to our Q&A session so um, the first one is from Dr. Uh, Kenwall. And the question is, what is the composition of local anesthesia? In... Just a minute. I have a call from my mother. Okay. No, I'm going to call you a meeting. I'm going to call you later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please repeat the question. Okay. Um, the, the first question is, what is the composition of your local anesthesia? And is there any difference between children and adults? And what type of, what number gauge of needle do you use? Uh, actually, we, we do not use 27 gauge needle. We usually use 23 because it's more comfortable to push. 27 gauge, you have to put uh, too much pressure to infiltrate. And our, uh, we, we make a cocktail of the xylocaine, 2%. And then we take adrenaline, 1 cc, and make it uh, add 9 cc of a normal saline to make it uh, 10 cc. Xylocaine, we take 2 cc and we add 15 cc of normal saline into it. So we make it uh, uh, 20 cc. Uh, sorry, we take 5 cc of uh, xylocaine and we add 15 cc of normal saline. And then we add 250, uh, depending upon the age of the, uh, age of the uh, weight of the patient, we add tenizamic acid to every pilot patient to every pilot patient and we inject locally and then we wait minimum for seven minutes as a religious tradition we do not start before seven minutes whenever i was impatient i started before seven minutes i had more bleeding i need i needed to stop to use cautery and the surgery time was prolonged when we wait for seven minutes, the, the field is almost bloodless. Many a time there's no bleeding or very little bleeding. Okay. And if and... there's bleeding, we will ask the anesthesiologist to give tranexamic acid systemically as well. Okay, and our next question is from uh, Dr. Seguapa. And the question is, um, is there any reason why some of the cleft lip were not performed uh, prior to the palatal repairs? Yes. We have a, 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 normally if the patient reports to us before nine months of age and patient has lip and the palate, 
we will do the lift first. But if the patient reports at nine months of age, we have a policy. We always go for the pilot first because the speech is more important. And we have a, a suspicion that if we do the lift first, patient may not come back for the pilot. Because in our area, many of the uh, rural areas, people would feel lift has been done, patient face is almost normal, so speech is not that important. So when we do the pilot first, patient will always, always come back for the lip repair. So after nine months of age, we always do the pilot first. And if you do the pilot first, um, how long after do you perform the lips? Usually four months or five months after the pilot repair. And uh, also the doctor asked if it's possible to have a copy of the presentation afterwards. <laughs> because it will be already available on the YouTube. Yes. It will be available okay. on the YouTube. And then we will provide the YouTube links um, after on our Facebook page as well. So yeah. um, Dr. Seguapa, you can see the um, video there. Okay, our next question is from Dr. Makwala. And then the question is, is there any difference in terms of the rate of the wound breakdown between a continuous suture technique and a uh, interrupted suture technique? Actually, uh, there is a very good story behind how did we started using uh, the continuous suture. I was in Faisalabad and this is probably 2004. And my anesthesiologist wanted to go earlier and he was pushing me for years. Can you do, can you finish the surgery in short time? I said, okay, I will try. So what I did, I used the continuous for the nasal layer and continuous for the oral layer. And he was happy and he went earlier. And when I followed the patient, there was no problem. So then I started using or a continuous switch for the nasal and the oral layer. But because we wanted to publish this, we did a randomized study. It was a double blind. We, uh, uh, we did in complete unilateral cleft pilot patient. Every patient was unilateral cleft pilot patient. And they were all almost, they were all more than, uh, they, 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 they were all unilateral complete. And then in one group, we did the continuous suture and we noted the time of the nasal layer closure and the oral layer closure. And, and, the, and the total time of surgery uh, for the oral and the nasal layer closure, because sometimes there will be more bleeding, that time was not uh, counted. And then in the other group, we did the interrupted suture in the nasal layer, interrupted in the oral layer. And then we compared both the groups. We had two fistula in each group, but the time used in continuous suture was much less as compared to the interrupted suture. So the medicine was less used, surgery was finished earlier, anesthesia charges were less. So overall, the uh, expenses were less. And we published this paper in PRS Global Open in 2018. And this paper won Best Southeast Asian Paper Award. Okay. And our next question is from Dr. Malik. The question is, was the nasal layer closed with muscle and block? No. Uh, we usually close the nasal layer first so that the muscles become relatively taut and the muscle dissection is more comfortable. But we... Uh, we, we never close the uh, muscle before the nasal closure. We do the nasal ear closure, we dissect the levators, and we push the levators back as far as possible, very near to the uvula. Or if we have done the pharyngeal flap, we would like to suture the muscle at the base of the pharyngeal flap, taking a good bite of the superior constrictor muscle. And then we do the oral layer. Okay, and our next question is from Dr. Kangwal. The question is that um, you mentioned you measured the length of the pellet visually, right? Is there um, a numerical number that you can give for a short length or a long length? Pellet? Actually, this is basically a surgeon perspective during the surgery. And uh, with passage of time, the surgeon 
it can be comfortable um, but we can classify the pilot lens uh, as per randall classification uh, the, the randall one is when the uvula is touching the posterior pharyngeal wall randall two is when the uvula is uh, touching the posterior half of the adenoid pad and randall three is when the uvula is touching the anterior half of the adenoid pad and randall four is when the uvula is anterior to the adenoid pad which is which means that the pilot is very much short but generally uh, during surgery when we release the oral and the nasal layer then we can better examine the length of the pilot before when the oral and the nasal layer are combined or to, or uh, together uh, it may be difficult after the tissues are released properly then we can be more comfortable to decide whether we have to do something more or not and then our next question is from Dr. Olusanya. And then the question is, um, what has been your experience with the speech outcomes? So I suppose she is uh, questioning, um, like how often do the, um, is there necessary to do like a, a revision or to treat for the function um, speech problems afterwards? Actually, you see the uh, speech problem, speech development depends on a lot many factors. It depends on the surgeon's uh, expertise. And then it depends on the family's compliance. Sometimes you have done the surgery very good, but the family is not that bothered to help the kid with the speech development. But everything accounted, if the speech development is not good, I'm not speech pathologist will keep on calling the patient and the family and the, he will he will be explaining to the family how you can improve the speech but we usually wait up to three and a half years of age and when we do the final speech evaluation and if the patient uh, speech does not improve then we will go for a pharyngeal flap okay and our next question is from dr zell and the question is, how do you design the lateral incision line? Actually, when we published the paper uh, in 2016, probably uh, the radical dissection of greater palatine vessel, that paper or that technique has helped us to operate lot many wide cleft pilot patients. And now we almost do in every Pilot patient. We always do the dissection of the liver, section of the greater palatine vessel. It will, uh, it will make the mucopressor flap mobile. And we can, we have uh, in larger fistula we have used one flap to cover on the other side. So whenever we do the radical dissection of the greater palatine vessel, the flap is more mobile, and we are more comfortable with the dissection of the nasal layer and the oral layer. And our fistula rate has dropped quite radically when we our flaps are quite mobile in the midline. Okay. And our next question is from Dr. Mahal. And the question is, do you do MRIs before raising pharyngeal flaps? We do not have that much money to do MRI for our patient because 99% of our patients, they are done free. Free means free, no, no hidden charges. So we, we, we do not afford, our hospital do not have MRI. And our next question is, a, um, do you, um, did you do the recording through an operating microscope? No, the, no. Actually, the... we do not use microscope. And I usually do not use even loops. Although loops are much better to use, they will be very helpful. We usually do the recording uh, by uh, by the zero angle uh, endoscope. We do not use any microscope because microscope will uh, prolong the time of surgery. Our our surgery time is quite uh, quite very much economical. Like say soft pilot, we do in thirty minutes. Incomplete 45 minutes complete in one hour bilateral, maybe in 90 minutes or so. Fringe flap, sometimes we do in 25 minutes. 
So we do not use any microscope. And our next question is from Dr. Flores. And the question is, how does um, genetics um, affect this treatment plan? Actually, a, we, we have some syndromic patients as well. But even then we operate, we, we do have many patients who come with cerebral palsy. Even then we operate because I still remember uh, late uh, Professor Nuda, he was uh, asked a question in 2002 when I attended the first Shangan workshop. What is the maximum age when we can repair the palate? When I was being trained uh, during my uh, residency, my professor, late Professor Khalid Durani, he told us that you should not repair any palate beyond four years of age because he thought that the speech becomes fixed in the cerebral cortex by four years of age. After that, if you repair the pilot, there is no advantage. But when Professor Nuda was asked, he said there are two objectives of the pilot repair. We create a barrier between the oral and the nasal cavities, and we want to have good speech production. Even if you achieve one objective, that you create a barrier between the oral and the nasal cavities, and the nasal secretion do not fall in the oral cavity, you have benefited the patient. But during, the, during many years of our uh, surgery, we have observed if we do the dissection of the levator in a good way and we put it back, switch it to the nasal mucosa, the speech does improve. Although it will vary in different patients and the speech pathology will also be able to help us. So uh, we do not have any problem to, we have operated many pilot patients at the age of 50 years or even more than 50 years old patients. So speech does improve. Okay, and Dr. Baba asked for a rough estimate of the percentage of submucous patients needing surgery. I think, uh, this uh, percentage always comes uh, through the door of the speech pathologist okay. because he is the one who will listen to the speech of every patient. And uh, if the uh, submucous, the width of submucous portion is very, very narrow and the patient can speak little bit comfortably, we can ask the family to wait, let's say up to one and a half year if the child's world uh, speech is going comfortably, progressing comfortably, we can wait a little bit more. But probably 90% of these patients will need surgery. More than 90% of the patients will need surgery. Because when we do the surgery, the speech development becomes more of anatomical and physiologically good. Otherwise, uh, we, we may have some false hope that this child speech is progressing good. I have missed many of my uh, patients uh, for whom I did the lip repair, uh, incomplete lip repair, and I could not uh, diagnose the submucosculus palate at right time. And when the child was one and a half year old, the family came back, the speech is not good. I had another look, then I, oh, oh my God. I missed the diagnosis. So then I operated the patient and the speech became good. So I think as a surgeon, we should, uh, we should prefer doing the surgery. We should not wait more than uh, uh, two years of age because as long as we wait more and more, the speech development becomes a little bit difficult. Okay, and our uh, next question is um, again from Dr. Ulusanya. And the question is, what is your average surgical time for these submucous um, palatal repairs? Uh, it, it, it depends if we do just you do the midline incision. Maybe we can do in 30 to 35 minutes if we make lateral incision, maybe in 45 minutes or so. And then what if you have to do an, an additional pharyngeal flap? If we do the fungi flap with the primary surgery, it, it just takes 
15 minutes more, not more than that. Okay. And then um, Dr. Albati asked, can you um, tell us a little bit about um, perhaps your surgical instruments that might make a difference for uh, palatal surgeries? Yes, actually, uh, we, we have uh, some special instrument. I, I, would, I would like to uh, uh, appreciate uh, Professor Martin Goldstein from uh, USA. He has been working in New Mexico, in, in, in New Mexico City. Uh, and but he belonged to New Jersey. In 2005, uh, when we had a, an earthquake in Pakistan, I requested all my friends outside they, if they can help us. So whatever instrument he had, he was a retired person. He sent all his instrument to me. So I got many of the instrument for the pilot repair from his set. And then because we have our own instrument company, so we could manufacture those instrument at our company. And now those instrument we use in every pilot repair. We have three or four types of periaphery elevator for our pilot repair. Those are quite helpful. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Fayats, for the uh, Q and A session. So that okay. should be the. Uh, I would like to request Professor Nivaldo Alonso from uh, <laughs> Sao Paulo. Please share your words. Uh, uh thank you, thank you, Gulan, thank you uh, for this uh, opportunity. I, I'm, I'm, I was, uh, you know, the first time when I, I saw your classification. I was very curious because uh, when you talk about 3A and 3B, I said that I never saw the 3A and 3B. And, and then I, I realized that we have a different classification system for cleft palate because we, we call what we call, you call 3A or 3B, we call uh, uh, incomplete uh, posterior cleft palate. We don't call submucose uh, cleft palate. We have here as a classification for submucous uh, cleft palate is only uh, when you have a, uh, the size of the palate is uh, almost normal and you only have a, like a bifid uvula, bifid uh, posterior nasal uh, spine, and also you have a VPI, you know, veropharyngeal insufficiency. So it means that it's really so difficult to make the diagnosis very early. So most of our patients came with uh, what we call submucous uh, cleft palate at the age of uh, three. But uh, I have to say that you your presentation is very clear. You show a very interesting uh, algorithm for correction of cleft palate. And then, and I really, uh, is, I'm really impressed with this uh, uh, algorithm. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, very, very nice. Uh, for the young guys, and uh, also you you mentioned in your presentation, and sometimes uh, you, you, your your presentation is so complete because some of our patients that we call submucous uh, cleft palate, when you make uh, uh, this uh, the the undermining of the muscles, you most of the time you can find a very hypoplastic uh, muscle. It means that uh, sometimes you need to have a. Uh, your tool to have like a, a pharyngeal flap or even uh, think about another technique to elongate the palate. We, at the beginning, we start doing a pharyngeal flap, but after six, we only make some difference in this four or six. We, we think that at the age of six year old, you can achieve, you still achieve some good results for the speech. So, uh, and for us, uh we now uh, a little have some concerns about the, the pharyngeal flap because we have a study a long long term uh, follow up patients that we we saw that uh, we have a, a really high uh, percentage of a uh, uh, sleep apnea on this pharyngeal flaps because you know we have a a tailor made pharyngeal flap it means that uh, we measure the size of the gap by nasal endoscopy. And then we, we uh, make the pharyngeal flap 
based on the size of the gap. It means that sometimes you have very small holes in the lateral side. So then uh, uh, now uh, I saw your pharyngeal flap is a small one in a triangular shape. It means that this is uh, maybe is a very interesting idea, only elongated at a very early age, the palate. But uh, it, for me, your presentation was uh, excellent. I, I congratulate you. It's just, uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here and uh, learn a lot about this because it's uh, we have a, a different uh, uh, points of view in this, uh, the same thing, but uh, really very nice presentation, very nice uh, uh, documentation and pictures and, 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 and movies about your cleft lip about uh, treatment. Thank you very much, Fayas. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity here. It's my pleasure, Nevaldo, and congratulations on your book on the craniofacial cleft. It's very ac excellent book. You, you have literally shared your experience with the world because it was a very difficult sector and you have shared almost every type of craniofacial cleft in your book. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks to visit you and your center in Baru in November. Thanks for your hospitality. Thank you, Pang. Thank you for Fayas. Yeah, thank you, Professor Afonso. And thank you for all those that come in and uh, the question from our audience. And thank you, Professor Fayas, your excellent presentation to date. Uh, even we already learned three times of Professor Fayas, the, the lecture, and all those lectures are all talking about the clip palette. However, every time the lecture and every time the presentation always give us the amazing and different field of the learning aspect each time. So even for the first time, Professor Fayaz showed lots of uh, demonstration to repair very difficult uh, fistula over the oral nasal area. And the last time and this time, yeah, so even this time, for me, I even cannot to see so detailed classification for those the patient with the clap palate. Yeah, so really amazed uh, for I already learned from my professor in Chang'an too. Uh, of course, I, I know Professor Fayaz, you have wanted a time to show the instrument from Pakistan, right? No, but, 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 but apparently I, I don't have uh, I'm in okay. my office, uh, so I don't have the instrument. I, but maybe I, I can okay. share it next time. I can sure, share. Sure, no problem. Okay, yeah. so I, I would like to invite uh, all uh, our participants here and the priest uh, to turn on your screen with me. Yes, even now, uh, it's uh, the daytime or the evening times. And I hope all the participants can, we can embrace and together to have the first time of ICC in 2024. And because we have opportunity to meet online and I hope all you guys can still can come join the presentation as well, uh, come join the webinar as well. So I will count to three and please give me a big smile, big smile like me. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I saw a lot of good friend uh, EK and uh, Dr. Uma, Dewey and uh, yeah, IV. Okay, one, two, cheese. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to turn to the next page. Yeah, and uh, in the next page, yeah, yeah, Professor uh, Yoshi Hadori and uh, Gonzalez. Okay, one, two, cheese. Yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, our next time, the ICC the webinar, we are located on the January 2022. Uh, and uh, that will be presented by the Korean professor, Dr. Ba, and he will share his experience of the cranial stenosis, the reconstruction with, with us. Uh, always, uh, thank you for all the friends. And I have to say thank you again for our two very important panelists. One is Professor Honda from 
Iwate Medical University, and the one is Professor Berna Tensipek from the Philippines, uh, especially from uh, Professor Nodov, the established the NCF Philippine as well. Okay, thank you, Professor Fayas, and I uh, hope to much. see you Pleasure. guys. Thank you. Hope to thank see you. you guys three weeks yeah. later. Thank you, Professor thank Avanzo from okay. Brazil. Yeah, thank this you very much. Very, very... My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Dr. Baruch from Janning from Kashmir. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you Junior. Okay. And thank have you, a good one you, and have a good yeah. day. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Professor Flores. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bruna. Bye.